Well, thank you for joining us tonight for our first Live from the Library program of 2019. Um, our program is presented by the Walnut Creek Library Foundation, and my name is Susan Moon. I'm the executive director of the foundation. I, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight, uh, Minuteman Press Lafayette and East Bay Times. Tonight, we have local Bay actress, Lori Strawn, who has performed in the theaters throughout the region for over 15 years. She's played Dorothy Brock in 42nd Street at Bay Area Musicals and Mrs. Hannigan and Annie at Diablo Theater Company, to name a couple of her favorite roles. Now to introduce our program. As one writer recently said, no one was, vi was ever neutral about our guest today. Loved by some, hated by others, she was a leader who never sought power or gain for herself. She pursued justice and equality for everyone and helped us all, one tiny step at a time, move towards a more just and compassionate world. Please help me welcome a lady who has no trouble introducing herself. My name is Eleanor Roosevelt, and I'm very pleased to be here to speak with you this evening. <laughs> a few important questions have been much on my mind lately. And I thought, perhaps if we had a chance to speak, and I could share some stories from my life, perhaps we could begin to answer some of these questions for ourselves. <laughs> Questions such as, how is a leader created? Are we ever conscien conscious of the good or the ill we do to others? And how do we weather criticism and pursue our goals and our dreams? How do we turn those dreams into realities? Now, I must say, I never set out to be a leader. At best, I, ooh, <laughs> I hoped to be caring, to be useful, to be regarded with affection. But the adventures in my life afforded me opportunities to be brave, and to lead, and to risk. I'd like to tell you a story, if I may. And then perhaps I can answer some of your questions. Now, once upon a time, there lived a little girl who was very sad and lonely. Her name was Eleanor, and she was born in 1884 in New York City into a family whose wealth and manners were the, play, the stuff that fairy tales are written about. Eleanor. is an ugly, scared little girl. At least, I always thought so. And this opinion was shared by my beautiful mother, Anna, whose nickname for me was Granny. Well, imagine Anna is in the nursery with her two adorable little boys, and in the doorway stands Eleanor. Silent, unsmiling, a finger forever in her pouty little mouth. Well, come in, Granny, Anna would sigh. She simply could not imagine what was to become of this shy, timid, plain little girl. But my father, Elliot, thought I was lovely. He called me Little Nell after a story by Charles Dickens, and he was to me a knight in shining armor. Whatever we did, riding horses, reading, exploring new places, I wanted nothing more than to please Papa to be his brave little Nell. <laughs> One day, I was walking downtown with my nurse, and I espied my father across the road, riding in his new cart. Well, I waved at Papa, and he saw me, and he, he raced across the street, and Mohawk, his new horse, stopped just inches from where I stood. <laughs> well, Papa said he would be delighted to take me home, but first a ride through the park. And I reached up and I was lifted up into the seat beside him and into a strong hug. <laughs> his face was flushed, his eyes shone as he says, Mohawk was not quite broken in yet. 
Let's you and I show him who's boss. And a snap of the whip brought us forward into oncoming cabs and carts. He urged the horse with a hey up and another snap. We were rounding a corner into Central Park, just missing a little boy holding on to his mother's hand. Well, the woman screamed at my father, swore under his breath. <laughs> and I looked back at the little boy. His, his eyes, they were large with fear and wonder. And just as I was turning front, we raced it past a carriage and we squeaked by another one on the left. And father's eyes now were open wide. And he says, if he gave him rain and said hoopla, mohawk would try to jump over all the carts in the path. I clutched tightly to his jacket. I said, I hope you do not say it. But I did not ask him to stop. If he thought me a coward, he would never stop and take me with him again. And I wanted to be with Papa no matter what. Well, Mama never told me about Papa's struggle with alcohol, with depression. I am certain it was because she did not wish to worry her child. Yet how much easier it would have been to know. There were reasons for sending Papa away. And that Mama was not to blame. And I was not to blame either. At the age of 10, I had lost my Mama and one of my two little brothers to diphtheria, and harder still my father, Elliot, who died after suffering from a fall. My little brother and I were raised by my grandmother Hall in a very large, dark house where she tried to impose rules and discipline. This house was not a happy one. I did my best to help my brother to feel not alone not abandoned, but I continued to live in a dream world most of the time, training myself not to hope for those things my grandmama would not allow. And the list of things not allowed was very long indeed. Well, eventually it was decided that I should go away to school as my mother had wished. And after much careful thought, it was determined that I should go to a boarding school in England. Now, while the idea of such a long journey and being alone at school, it, it was terrifying to me, I also hoped I might be able to start fresh in a new place. <laughs> now, I made the long ocean voyage with an aunt, who, an aunt who hated sea travel. And she told me the best way to bear it was to remain in one's bed for the entire journey. <laughs> and this is what we did. And needless to say, I was a very pale and a very wobbly 15-year-old when I was delivered to the Allenswood School. It was here that I met the second most important person in my life, Mademoiselle Sylvestre. She was the headmistress, she was a teacher, and eventually she was my friend. Now, at the time, Young women in my position were educated in order to be a success in society, to be a graceful ornament, a pretty part of someone else's life. Thankfully, Mademoiselle did not see me this way. She saw more in me, and over the next years, she did her best to bring my nobler qualities out of hiding. I still remember some of the students, some of my friends, would leave me gifts of books and flowers. I could not believe that they looked up to me, but they did. And while at school, it, it became my ambition to do some good in the world, to make a mark. I could feel it in me sometimes that I could do much more than I had ever imagined, and I meant to try until I did succeed. I was so happy at school. How I hated to leave. But duty required that I return home and join all of the other privileged young women of my day and make my debut. Oh, the clothes, the invitations, the visiting, the parties, the dances, they were all a part of coming out. <laughs> Let me set the scene. I remember well an embassy ball, my first season. I was standing in a corner 
while the third dance was being twirled out before me, my dance card was not full. <laughs> oh, I have partners for supper and for the cotillion. I made sure of that before I left the house, but oh, how agonizing the space is in between. I am too tall, I am too shy, I am too plain, and I believe I am becoming rooted to this spot, and my foot has just fallen asleep. Oh dear, my friend Sally's father is coming toward me, the hero rescuing the wallflower. I don't wish to dance. I, uh, yes, ah, uh, oh, uh, that would be very kind. I look over my hero's shoulder. Oh, let's be honest, I look over his bald head. Is everyone staring? Are they all grateful some nice old man has rescued Eleanor and spared them the trouble of dancing with a silly old granny of a girl? I try to smile and make pleasant conversation. I'm good at neither. My teeth stick out and I've got nothing frothy and delightful to say. I cannot wait to go home. Well, I came and went as far as New York society was concerned. <laughs> I knew I was the first girl in my mother's family who was not a belle. And though I never acknowledged it to anyone at the time, I was deeply ashamed. But armed with new skills and some confidence, I opted to make the best of things, to find a way to be of use. I began touring factories and workshops to report on the working conditions of the poor, and I joined the Junior League. That sounds so official. <laughs> it was really just a group of young girls anxious to do something helpful in the city in which we lived, and I agreed to teach dancing and calisthenics at a settlement house. Now, on my way to the Rivington Street settlement, I. I, I walked very quickly, and I, I'm afraid I checked several times to make sure my handbag was still on my wrist. I knew that I looked like someone who didn't trust anyone around her, and I knew in my heart that I did not. Walking to the settlement house, I was nervous and alert, but I saw women standing on front stoops talking, laughing, passionate, heads thrown back, faces flushed. I saw children running in the alleyways, finding fun where none seemed to exist. Now how could the children that I taught work in factories for sometimes 12 hours a day and yet come to my class ready to learn and play? I teach them to dance. How silly. I feel foolish in the face of their need and their courage, and I want to do more. Oh, now I remember, though, some of the helpful advice from my friends, some of my relatives, uh, advice such as, Eleanor, how can you waste your time and strength like that? Why open yourself up to criticism just when you've entered society? Or, we'll have no more talk of dances and fun. Eleanor has come to remind us of our duty. Or, you may not care for yourself, but I hope you will remember that all of us are at risk of illness and fever with you exposing yourself to those kinds of people. <laughs> I remember best the reaction of my cousin, Franklin, when he first came to pick me up after work one day. His eyes, how shocked they looked to witness people living in such cold, hard conditions. Franklin understood why I did this work. I looked into his eyes and I saw acceptance, affection. And for the first time since Papa, I felt I was not alone. Franklin and I were very distant cousins, and we had not seen much of each other in childhood. He had been a bright, only child in a very wealthy family. I believe he must have been very lonely, 
surrounded by adults, no children to play with. Now, he conquered his shyness by becoming very outgoing, by, by his real curiosity about everyone he met. And Franklin and I were very young when we became secretly engaged. When our families learned we intended to marry, his mother was not pleased. And she required that we wait a year, and she promptly trotted him off to Europe in hopes that perhaps he might forget about our agreement. <laughs> but we were very determined, Franklin and I. We waited the required time, forcing our concerned relations to acknowledge we intended to marry. And on March 17, 1905, my Uncle Ted took time out from marshalling two St. Patrick's Day parades to give me away. His presence caused quite a bit of excitement. Uncle Ted was president of the United States at the time, so <laughs> he easily became the center of attention. <laughs> oh, his daughter Alice once said of Uncle Ted, father wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> With this state of affairs left Franklin and I much to ourselves, while all of our guests followed after Uncle Ted. <laughs> Franklin, one of the most important people in my life was now my husband. I wish I could tell you I remained the bold, capable leader I had become in school, but I did not. I was so eager to please, to be accepted. I allowed my new husband and his mama to make all of my decisions for me, where we lived, how we lived, how we raised our children. It seemed as if all of my independent spirit had disappeared. I lived for over 10 years with a, a sense of failure. I did what I had to do to keep things running smoothly and with a husband, a mother-in-law and five lively children. This was quite a job in itself, yet I felt overwhelmed at times by my sense of failure and fear. Well, these fears were fully realized when I discovered that Franklin had fallen in love with someone else. I was unable to eat, or sleep, or really enjoy life. But when the bottom dropped out of my own particular little world and I was forced to face myself and my life honestly for the first time, I determined to change. I chose to embrace my life, to find a way to be useful, to be joyful, and I followed this determination with passion. Franklin and I remained together, our relationship grounded in deep admiration, affection, and a mutual determination to find some way to make our mark on the world, to find a way to be useful. Well, to be useful, that is easily said, but what was I to do? What did it mean? Well, I needn't have worried. Time presented its opportunities, as it always will do. Franklin became ill with polio. He lay in his sick room for weeks with the shades drawn, unable to move, uncertain whether he would ever walk again. Seeing my husband truly helpless, it was terrible. But I believe his disability, his illness, taught him the greatest of all lessons, never-ending patience and persistence. Franklin never stopped trying to regain the use of his legs, but he never let his disability stop him from living life on his own terms.
Now, as Franklin wanted to pursue a political career, and I did not wish to, to stand in his way and to force him into the, a life as a gentle invalid, I myself had to enter political life. Oh, I had been active as the wife of Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and I had worked at Red Cross canteens in the First War. But now, more than ever, I would have to step out and speak. Well, thankfully, Louis Howe, my husband's most trusted advisor, he endeavored to train me to be a really good public speaker. Now, he would watch whenever I spoke before any group. <clears throat> And when my fear would cause my hands to shake, he would tell me, hold on to the lectern, not the speech. <laughs> when my fear would cause me to giggle at odd moments, we must now understand the very serious nature of this issue. <laughs> <laughs> he would later say, your childish giggling makes you sound silly and stupid, and you are neither. When you're nervous, stop. Smile and breathe deeply. And finally, when my fear would cause my voice to rise in pitch, making it sound shrill, he would later say, pick out two or three people in the audience, make eye contact and talk to them. And this was the magic key for me. Because I did care about the people that I spoke to. I cared about the issues that I discussed. And finally, Louis would say to me, have something to say, say it, and sit down. <laughs> Thus, the training of a reluctant world leader began. <laughs> well, I continued to help Franklin, continued to raise my children. Franklin was elected the governor of New York, and I began to teach once again. <laughs> I lived my life usefully, and I was very happy. I I kept speaking and, and keeping Franklin's name alive in politics. I, I made friends. I made great friends, which lasted a lifetime. I was so happy. It was uh, with difficulty I accepted the fact that my husband was ready for a change. And on a very cold day of March 4th, 1933, our country welcomed a new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I was so terribly sad. Oh, not for myself, not for my husband, for myself, not for our country. I knew he would make a, a fine and thoughtful leader. But I had loved all of my new challenges helping to lead women in taking a more active role in politics, teaching school once again, camping with my sons, driving my own car, editing a newsletter, co-owning my own business. And now it seemed I would have to step back and walk in the shadow of the president and be his meek and gentle hostess. Oh, how I dreaded the idea. <laughs> But my dear friend, Lorena Hickok, offered me one small glimmer of hope. She suggested I hold my own press conferences, open to women reporters only. As a journalist, Lorena knew firsthand how few editors would hire women. And my press conferences would force them to do so, to report on political issues. There may have been a box of candy going around, but this was the first time a first lady had held a press conference on the record in the White House. <laughs> now, I liked that. <laughs> My press conferences were just the beginning of many firsts, which I enjoyed. Thanks to the true partnership in my marriage, I, I remained the eyes and ears for my husband, traveling places, meeting people where Franklin in a wheelchair could not. Our country was in the midst of the Depression. Many people were out of work. They were terrified. We saw another war. And there were many, many things that I wanted Franklin to deal with directly and quickly. Often I was 
not successful in this. I was very eager that he address fair work and housing practices, discrimination, the injustice of the Japanese internment. Now, while Franklin and I, we agreed on all of this, he was often unable to act upon any of this politically. Being the conscience of the New Deal, as some called me, it could be terribly frustrating at times. But I did not stop my work and I did not stop my witnessing. Now, some people disliked the idea that a first lady could influence the president to such a degree. But Franklin, he respected my ideals, though he often thought me unrealistic. It's true. I'm afraid I was very impatient. I would never have made a really good politician. But Franklin would smile and he would say, you go right ahead and stand for whatever you feel is right. Besides, I can always say I can't do a thing with you. <laughs> I was living my life usefully. I felt I had a real purpose and a real role in helping my husband and in shining a light on issues on people who desperately needed attention. But in April of 1945, while in Warm Springs, Georgia, my husband died. Riding the funeral train which carried Franklin from Georgia back to Washington, I, I kept the window shades up. I looked out at the country that Franklin and I loved, at all the men and women, at every country crossroads, at every station platform mourning the loss of their president. This was how I mourned for my husband. As the train approached Washington, I felt that the story was over. But I was wrong. President Truman asked me to be useful once again. As World War II came to its end, he, he asked me to serve as a delegate to the first meeting of the United Nations. Now, I was very afraid to accept a position as delegate. <laughs> I was nervous. I can imagine how nervous the other delegates were to accept me, a silly old woman. I can imagine them saying, well, we can't put her on the political committee. Oh, does she know anything about the law? Oh! Here's a safe spot for her. Committee three, humanitarian issues. She can't do much harm there. As it turned out, my committee became one of the most controversial. At one point, it was up to me to speak for the United States. I, I was badly frightened, but I knew I had to do my best. If I failed, it would be that much more difficult for other women to rise to positions of power in this and in other important organizations. Now, I remembered Louis Howe's advice to connect what I was saying to the people I was trying to reach, and suddenly it wasn't just the other delegates that I was speaking to and speaking for. It was refugees from the war, homeless and terrified. And I wanted also to reach men and women back home who were desperate for work, and the children, the most innocent victims of war and poverty, all of these human beings, they were all worth speaking for. They were all worth fighting for. It turns out Franklin was right. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. How is a leader created? Well, by learning and living. And it certainly takes curiosity. I hope that each one of you considers yourself an adventurer. 
I hope that you draw upon that courage and sense of adventure in your own life. I hope you will all choose to join me in lighting a candle rather than cursing the darkness. And now, as I hope to have a chance to answer some of your questions, I will remember Louis Howe's advice. I had something to say, I said it, and I will now sit down. Thank you. <laughs> you for such a, a warm reception. I'm very delighted to be here and I would love to answer questions. Now I know some have written things down but also if you'd like to simply ask me a question please raise your hands. I'll be happy to try to answer them. Yes? I took an, yes I took an airplane ride with Amelia Earhart. It was wonderful. I so desperately wanted to learn to fly. I wanted to pilot a plane myself and I must, I must tell you actually in confidence that not, Amelia was, was not the only woman handling the controls on that one particular flight. <laughs> we had a magical flight over the capital and it was quite a beautiful evening. I wanted desperately to be a pilot myself but Franklin said I simply cannot have you up in the air please stay on the ground. <laughs> Although what's interesting is I flew so frequently I earned the nickname Eleanor Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and the plane they chose to give me was the second best, <laughs> it was the old shoe. Uh, they didn't deem it safe enough uh, and comfortable enough for the President of the United States, but they said, oh, we'll just give it to the First Lady, that'll be just fine. And it was. I loved to travel, I loved to meet people and to have discussions and see something of life that was different from my own. I was very grateful to Ms. Earhart for helping me achieve a a long-held dream and ambition. <laughs> and the Tuskegee Airmen. The Tuskegee Airmen, yes. I was a great supporter of them and I was so excited both the Tuskegee Airmen who were an all-black unit of pilots, they were able to help in the war effort, learn to fly. Also women were able to help and fly in the war effort. There were two very, uh, very powerful women heading up uh, flight training and flight work in the United States. Unfortunately, our women pilots could only stay within the United States unless they chose to just go to England and learn themselves over there. But here, they did a, a very valuable service. They would take planes from the manufacturer and without all the instruments in them, they would fly them across the country to whichever base or, or unit needed them first. Oftentimes, they would be crucial in helping the young pilots, the male pilots, learn to fly the aircraft. I was very excited by this. I received many letters from young women at the beginning of World War II hoping that they might be able to serve in this way. So I was very happy when it turned out that they were able to do so. Yes? Yes, it was a terrible tragedy, I think. I think it was one of our great mistakes. Um, Japanese internment, citizens of our country and uh, resident aliens who were not allowed to pursue citizenship, their parents, uh, were taken uh, forcibly from their homes and their businesses on the coasts and uh, taken to internment camps where it was very desperate. It was often freezing or it was unbearably hot, oftentimes with as little as, as sheds for, for shelter. One thing I must say when I did visit this, the camps, they were so very determined to accept this reality and to make it better themselves. They they were amazing. They grew gardens. They, they were desperate to stay in their own homes and businesses because they wanted to produce food for the war effort. Many of the families were farm families. And so they, they took a small bit of that effort and they were able to create the most beautiful gardens. 
with nothing in the middle of, of the desert and in, in the high desert it could be very cold and they were not accepted into the other into the communities nearby and then many of our young men went off to fight with their parents still in camps uprooted from their homes and it took many decades for even even a restitution of an apology I feel that it was one of the greatest mistakes and I believe that we should examine our mistakes and I believe that we should talk about them I was also able to go to Fort Ontario in Oswego New York during the war this was where we had a group of just over a thousand refugees from Europe who were Jewish refugees I tried very hard as did Franklin to to allow more refugees in both before the war and during the war we were often unable to do that we certainly officially were not able to do this we did help swell the roles in any way that we could but we did far too little and at Oswego they were um, the thousand uh, refugees were kept at Fort Ontario thankfully through the course of their stay there they were finally allowed the children were allowed to leave and attend public school people were allowed to go out into the community so this was different but still not good enough and I again believe we should examine these things yes Well, my first impression was very different from what my general impression became. <laughs> my first impression was that he was not a good influence on Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was, he was someone who enjoyed his cocktail hour and the hours beyond. <laughs> and much like my husband, he was a raconteur so when the two of them were together I'm afraid I often wondered just how much sleep my husband would eventually receive Winston was a larger than life character and at times I did not appreciate his large imprint upon our lives but I must tell you that in the following years during the war I gained a great affection and admiration for Prime Minister Churchill and I thought he was one of the remarkable people in my life and so opinions do change and if we do spend time and don't disengage and keep talking <laughs> sometimes good things can happen <laughs> but it was quite an awkward uh, first introduction I must say I never enjoyed the cocktail hour I never enjoyed the social drinking that was so prevalent in political life and indeed most any life I my family suffered greatly because of alcoholism and so I had seen so many loved ones fall under the influence and finally under the destruction of this particular disease that I was never comfortable with drinking to excess and so I'm afraid I was probably not the most vivacious of hostesses at times Yes. Could you comment on uh, Eleanor's intimate relationships with women? Ah, there's been a lot written about this. I would say that I had many loves in my life. And my letters certainly are prolific, especially my letters uh, between myself and Lorena Hickok. I also had dear, dear friendships with Nancy uh, Reed and Nancy Cook, I'm sorry, and Marion Dickerman. We actually had a business and home together. But I also had deep and very abiding, loving relationships with Earl Miller, with Joe Lash, with David Gurevich. And all of these were very important to me. I'm afraid my children probably thought at times that it was easier for me to love others than themselves it certainly was easier for me to be a better parent to my grandchildren than to my own children now I never spoke publicly about these very intimate love relationships in my life 
but there are thousands and thousands of letters. And I, I welcome you to look at them yourself. I longed for intimacy in my life. I didn't have a family who provided this. I did not know how to ask for it. I did not receive this from my husband. I did not know how to give this to my children. But thankfully, with people in my life like Lorena, and Earl, and David, and Joe, and countless others, I was able to finally get some sense of that intimate connection which can be achieved. I was longing for it. So I, I felt there was no love that was to be uh, judged too harshly. I, love is love. And I, I, I welcomed it into my life. And I do hope that if, if it serves to offer some people interest, curiosity, solace. You should, you should look at my life. I, I wrote quite a bit about it myself, but on these issues I did remain publicly silent. One more question, do we have time? Yes. Yes. Yes, actually they did. Well, Anna lived in the White House, and she was the official hostess for the end of Franklin's, well, his third term, and into the very beginning of what it was his fourth term. Um, I was off witnessing and traveling and meeting and thinking, and I would come home and probably badger my poor husband about the things that I was seeing, and he was actually very ill. He was far more ill than any of us understood. Anna did not ask anything of him in that way. Anna was his daughter. Anna adored her father. And Anna was sophisticated, intelligent. She was a wonderful hostess. And so it was, it was a good thing that she was there to serve as the hostess for my husband at the time. Although I was terribly, uh, well, I, I, was, I, I felt terrible that Anna went to Yalta, and I did not. I wanted to go with my husband, and, and he chose to have Anna attend with him instead. So there were times that this arrangement, it was hurtful. It, it, it was not always what I felt would have been the right thing for me, but it, it was the right thing for my husband at the time. So definitely, uh, Anna and her family lived in the White House with us. We had our grandchildren as much as we possibly could. We loved having our grandchildren with us. And a number of our grandchildren actually would stay and live with us for a great deal of time. My brother Hall lived with his uh, daughter in the White House for a time. And a number of them did live afterwards for short periods of time in Hyde Park. Um, the end of my life, many of the public things that I did, the jobs which I took on in advertising things or making appearances, many times it was to provide my children with some income because I was very conscious of how very difficult it must have been to be the child of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And I did feel very guilty about this. Yes. Well, one more. Yes, that's fine. Yes. Ah, yes. Was there another question? Oh, this is actually, it's, it's not a cape. It's a wonderful jacket, which towards the end of my life, I just loved this style. I, I had a number of suits, beautiful wool suits made that were swing jackets. And this was just something that I thought was delightful. I, I loved wearing this. It was so easy, and often I would be carrying my own typewriter. I'd carry my own case when I was going off of planes and onto trains and into cabs. And I always enjoyed having clothing that was, that was stylish and that I personally liked, but also was very easy to wear. And those planes were cold, so I often had to have at least one of my stoles or two, and I would always have a jacket. But at the end of my life, I loved this design. I loved the style. I, I think I would have enjoyed being, being alive had I been younger in the 1960s, because I think I would have enjoyed wearing some of those beautiful clothes. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> Susan, if I could just take one more moment. I wanted to just say, I'm, my name is Lori Strong, and I wrote Brave Little Nell almost 20 years ago because ever since I was a child, I had a very passionate response and curiosity to this family. And I just thought they exemplified people who made their mistakes and made their growth and made their lives happen in public. It was one of those things where they were so fascinating because there was nothing ever absolutely good or absolutely bad. They were human beings, right out loud. And I thought that was so exciting. And so I've been so pleased to be able to, to bring Eleanor to different people and to let everyone just understand something about this amazing humanitarian who started with so many challenges and what we would see as deficits and through determination and her will and experience and courage, she just made a decision that she was going to live out loud and she was going to do what she felt was right. And I just thank you so much for coming and sharing some of Eleanor with me. Thank you, Susan, for asking me. Um,